I want you to think of a person in your life who you disagree with. Someone you disagree with about something important. Something that really matters to you. The kind of thing that might start an argument. Now, think about a disagreement you've had with that person. Maybe it was about whether same-sex marriage should be legalised. Maybe it was about climate change. Maybe it was about economics or vaccinations or immigration. Everyone got someone in mind? This guy's got five, that's good. <laughs> so you know the feeling. You're disagreeing and you're both arguing your cases. But while you're listening to their case, you're probably listening for the opportunity to refute it, rather than listening to understand. And we've all been guilty of this. Because in that moment, what do we all want? We want the other person to change their mind. We want them to listen to us, really listen. We want them to nod their heads a little bit and say, you know what, you're right. But when was the last time you changed your mind? I'm going to hazard a guess and say that most of us here today think we're open-minded. We're the flexible ones. We're responsive to new information. So if I told you that you're not as open-minded as you think you are, you might feel a little bit offended, and I get that. But hear me out, even if you disagree with me. Because what I've learned as my time as a fact-check editor is just how hard it can be for people to change their minds about something they really believe in, even when they're faced with the facts. Changing our minds about something important takes time, and it takes a lot of effort. It often requires trust and respect. It demands empathy, vulnerability, and most of all, courage. It's a skill. And it's a skill most of us, even, every, even all of us here, could be better at and, and we need to be better at. We live in a time when the sum of human knowledge is increasing exponentially. And so much of that knowledge is right here at our fingertips. But are we really, really taking advantage of that knowledge? Or are our minds made up for good? Now, there's one small complication. Not all of this new information is created equal. In an age when we're inundated with conflicting messages, and there's so much information out there that is designed to mislead and deceive us, being able to assess what is quality information and what is not is one of the most important skills we can teach each other, share with each other, and with our children. But there is cause for hope. And there are a lot of people out there working to bring us the true picture. At The Conversation, we're also trying to do our bit to keep the information ecosystem healthy. Our teams of journalists work with academics around the world to publish news and analysis that's underpinned by academic research. And that allows us to respond to the issues of the day by drawing on all of that knowledge that is too often locked up in academic journals. We do that because we believe that sharing accurate information is fundamental to a healthy society. And we believe that that information needs to be freely available to everyone. As a fact check editor at The Conversation Australia, my job is to work with academic experts to explore the evidence for and against claims made by politicians and people of influence. Does fact checking work? In some ways, yes. Fact checks published by reputable organisations all around the world overturn false stories and harmful misinformation every single day. Here's one example. In March this year, a photo of a young white South African girl was widely shared on the internet. Now, this little girl was horrifically injured. She was covered in blood, her face torn from cheek to cheek. 
This photo was shared in the midst of um, heightened racial tensions in South Africa and accusations of racially motivated violence against white farmers. It was shared with the words, this is what savages do to white children in South Africa. They carve joker smiles in their faces. It was also shared with the hashtags, stop farm murders and white genocide. As shown by the US fact-checking site Snopes, the little girl's injuries were actually caused when she was attacked by her family dog in 2017. The good news is that little girl is all right now, but we just don't know how many people still believe that story to be true and what kind of consequences that could have. Here in Australia, our conversation fact check authors and editors have corrected and clarified hundreds of claims made by Australian leaders. Climate change, immigration, crime, energy policy, same-sex marriage, you name it, we've been there. But putting the facts of the matter on the record is one thing. Having people embrace that information is a whole new challenge. And that's where my job ends and your job begins. Because it's never just about the facts. Those facts are tied to social issues, which are usually tied to feelings. Those feelings might be tied to our sense of what is right and wrong, to the experiences each of us have had in our lives, and even to our loyalty to our tribes. We might also feel that we've independently and dispassionately assessed a subject, that we're up to date with all the latest information and that our conclusions on that topic are correct. And we could be right about that. But we must also acknowledge some of the psychological and social factors that each of us face when we're taking on board new information. For example, the illusory truth effect. The more often we hear a statement, the more likely we are to believe it's correct. New information is a lot harder for our brains to process. The more familiar a piece of information it is, and the easier it is for our brains to process it, the more likely we are to believe it's true, even when it's not. We're also subject to confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. These are our tendencies to seek out the evidence that support our existing views and question or reinterpret or reject the evidence to the contrary. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we're a lot more open to accepting new facts from the people and sources from within our own communities and more likely to reject even those exact same facts when they come from the other side. And these biases aren't overcome by education and expertise. Sometimes it can be the most educated people, the people most educated about a subject, who can be the most polarised. In our professional lives, accepting a certain fact might require us to change our course. When that change is too challenging a prospect, we might reject the fact outright instead. And often, what we believe to be true is part of our sense of belonging in a community. Information that could prompt a change in our beliefs, it's not just difficult to process, it could be a social risk, and it could lead us to isolation. And that's really scary stuff. These are just some of the reasons why we can find ourselves unable to agree on an issue, even when the facts of the matter appear to be well established. So, what can we do about it? <laughs> One thing we can do is to immediately stop tearing down leaders who change their minds when they're presented with new evidence. We've got to stop calling this a backflip. The ability and the willingness to change our minds when we're presented with better information is a trait we should value, and we need to applaud it. Another thing we can do is to rediscover the lost art of civil disagreement. Because disagreements aren't inherently bad. They're critical to intellectual process. They force us to defend our reasoning, and they spur us on to even better ideas. 
We don't need to shy away from disagreements when we know how to do them well. So here are a few things you might like to try in your next argument. Make sure you're listening to understand, really, really listening to understand, and not just listening for the chance to argue back. Engage your sense of curiosity. This can be really fun and interesting. Engage that curiosity and your empathy. It's one thing to know what someone believes, but it's another thing entirely to understand why they believe it. And it's in the why that we have the opportunity to connect. And when it is your turn to speak, take the time to retrace the steps you took to arrive at your conclusion. Try as hard as you possibly can to find at least one point of agreement, no matter how small. And then, of course, share the best evidence you have. Maybe it will even be a fact check, although there's plenty else out there. And you might want to leave it at that, because changing a mind, whether your own mind or someone else's, will not happen on the spot. Don't try to win the argument. Instead, try to create an environment where the seed of a new piece of evidence might be able to grow. The economist John Kenneth Galbraith said that when faced with the choice between changing one's mind and proving that there's no need to do so, almost everybody gets busy on the proof. We can do better. Instead, let's prove to ourselves that we have the intellect to reach for the best possible evidence and not just the proof that we want to see. The emotional intelligence to have fruitful conversations and the wisdom and the courage to change our minds when our knowledge grows. It's this combination of the cold, hard facts and the warmth of empathy that can draw us out of our silos and into a space where we can collectively make decisions, decisions that are in all of our best interests. Thank you. Thank you.